Peter Lewis, welcome to Competencies Without a Classroom. I'm super excited that you're here and that the people listening to this will get to learn a bit more about yourself, CSTF, and, and the journey that you've had in your career to date. But before we get into all that fun stuff, Peter, I like to start off this podcast the same way with every guest. We start off with maybe the most important question that I'm going to ask you today, because it, it really helps to set a tone for the rest of the interview and, and it gives our listeners answers to the question that they need answers to. So with that, Peter, when it comes to pineapple on pizza, are you a yes or a no? <laughs> no. I'm, I'm, <laughs> that's a critically important question. I'm a definite no. I, I can eat pizza with pineapple on it but if you ask me would i order it no i wouldn't okay at least you're willing to compromise that's a really important skill or competency as, as we're going to talk about today so peter lewis with the canadian scholarship trust foundation who are you and, and what are you doing for work right now yeah so thanks for for having me here I'm, I'm the vice president of the canadian scholarship trust foundation i'm also a vice president within the one of the subsidiaries of the company my official title in that capacity is as the chief revenue officer but you know today i'm here really talking to you about my my role in the, in the foundation which is is about how do we continue to to build the capacity of the foundation to fulfill our purpose, our mission. How do we make sure that we're doing everything we can to help make post-secondary education possible for more Canadian families? Uh, that's what we do. That's what drives us. That's our passion. And on the other side of my e equation, my chief revenue officer role, I, I run a sales team with roughly 500 or so sales representatives across the country that help families set up savings plans to help make post-secondary education possible for their families as well. So I've got a bit of a dual role there. Yeah, no kidding. Wearing uh, a number of, of different hats. So, I mean, let's, let's talk about that a little bit, Peter. I'm a young person listening to this. this. This podcast is for middle and high school students and their teachers. And I'm starting to think about my, my journey, my pathway uh, after high school. If I'm considering post-secondary for myself, how do I go to school to be a, a chief revenue officer, right? Or, or maybe an easier way to answer that question is, can you talk a little bit about your journey? I think the first thing that I would say is, let me start by, by just confessing to you that my undergraduate degree was actually in biology and music. It has absolutely nothing to do with anything I've done in my career at CST in terms of sort of those explicit topics that I, I studied at university. Yeah. But here's what I would say. The skills that you learn and you acquire through that, that post-secondary training are what can actually uh, propel you into your career. And, and so, you know, there is, uh, there's, there's all kinds of, of paths you could take to become a chief revenue officer if you wanted. You know, you could study economics, you could study, you could get an MBA, you know, there's all those kinds of things. But I think the big thing that drives you is you need to find, you know, the stuff that you're passionate about and, and take those skills and just continue to, to find uh, areas that you can expand every single day, learn something new, try something different. And you may get into a completely different place from where you started. And that's okay. As long as you're, you're having fun every day and doing something that's meaningful to you. Yeah. When you can connect it to what, what's meaningful and, and your purpose, that's, what's going to drive you no matter what your title is or kind of what journey it takes for you to be able to get there. So that makes a lot of sense, Peter, but if we get a bit more granular, so again, I'm a 16 year old, 17 year old listening to this and great. I understand that jobs are going to keep changing. What I study may not end up being where I work. Do you have any advice for the, the 16 year old, 17 year old? Maybe I haven't figured out what really drives me, what my purpose is, what I'm meant to do. As far as post-secondary, what should I look at as far as making a next step? Yeah, I think I think I think one of the things you need to, to do is, is try to keep your options as open as you can, particularly if you aren't don't have that sort of driven passion. Like there are some people who I, I've I've met young people who, you know, they're they're 15 year old years old and they know exactly what they want to do and exactly where they want to go and how they want to get there. And then they have a very clear path that they're following. But there's many folks. I mean, I have a number of children in my family that were kind of in that zone of I'm not quite sure what I want. So yeah. keep your options open. Like, you know, go and find a, a school that you believe in, start a studying a course of study, and you will often find through that that you'll actually find things that really interest you or where you can really drill in and, and get something that's going to be meaningful for you. The other thing I would say is be curious. Be yeah. curious. Look for different ideas. Open your mind and look for where there are things that you can actually explore different things. You know, uh, take a course that you, you know, would never naturally want to take, but if you get to that, that school and there's an option open and you can take a course that just doesn't naturally appeal to you, you might actually get in there and find something that is truly interesting to you. So be curious, be open-minded and keep your options open. Uh, and, and you're going to find your path as you kind of work your way through that. 
Yeah, I love that so much. And we love to talk about curiosity on this podcast. Sum, sum it all up that you know that life's going to take you in different directions. What you study is probably, statistically anyways, not going to be the, the end all be all. It may correlate, it may not, but focus on being curious, being open to new ex experiences, seeing where that will take you, and maybe being able to reflect on the transferable skills you are developing. Because the skills that you learned in, in music and biology, they might not all correlate to what you're doing as a chief revenue officer, but I bet there's a lot that do, right? It's yeah. fantastic advice. Well, and, and the other thing that I would just add to that is just be a learner, you know, uh, learn something new every single day, even if it's just something small, you know, if you're continually looking and saying, how can I add a new skill or how can I do something a little better? Or is there something else that I can, can add to my, my repertoire of, of skills? Learning is something that never ends. It, it, and if it ends, then you, you have a real problem. You need to be learning every day because the world changes. And as the world changes, uh, you continue to learn, you continue to adapt, you continue to find new ways to do, do things. I mean, listen, the last, the last year in particular, we've had to completely reinvent ourselves in terms of how we approach the business. And every single one in our organization had to learn new ways of doing things. You gotta be a learner if you wanna continue to succeed. Yep, that's super important. And it is one of the things that I have noticed with with young people these days, whether they like it or not, they've been forced to adapt every year, whether it's things like a pandemic or just the change in technology. So these people kind of have it built in, these young people, because they haven't known any any different for, for yeah. good or worse, right? So Peter, now we know a bit more about yourself and, and your journey and the different hats you wear between nine and five, but let's talk about after work. What, what keeps Peter Lewis interested? Like what are your, your hobbies, passions? You mentioned there's some young people in your life. Tell yeah, well, <laughs> well, I have a big family and we actually have seven kids, which most times when I say that people are surprised. Most of them are actually at or through university or college. I've got also five grandkids. So family is a big part of our life. We we love our family. We love spending time together. We do what we can. You know, other passions that I've got, uh, music is obviously a big one. I, I studied uh, piano growing up, studied piano and voice, and I, I did a, a lot with that. I don't do as much of that other than just for my own personal pleasure, but you know, I'll spend uh, an hour or so in an evening just sitting down working on some new music on a piano, that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah. it, it's good for me to keep sort of that creative uh, side of my brain going, and, and yeah. it's, it's something that I really love. I'm kidding. Well, maybe I'll jump on YouTube later and see if I can get lucky if I search in Peter Lewis, but <laughs> uh, maybe not YouTube. Peter, are you on, are you on Instagram personally? I am personally on Instagram. Yeah. The main reason I asked Peter and I love Instagram. I mean, it's, it's a love hate thing. So I, I have an account as well, but I've, I've actually deleted it from my phone just from a, a time management thing. I ended up scrolling when I didn't need to be right. So I, I love it because of the entertainment value that it brings, but I, I hate it sometimes because of what people post on there. So oftentimes it, it leaves me feeling very inauthentic that yeah. people are often choosing their best of or, or their highlight reel things to post. Right. And which, yeah isn't usually the truth. So I use this as a question, kind of a, as a segue to talk about, let's talk about failure. So the opposite of that highlight reel. Peter, what's what's a, a failure you've had in your personal, maybe professional life that you can speak to that you think the young people listening to this would benefit from here? Yeah, I think it's, I'll, I'll speak about something in my, my own sort of professional life. I mean, quite a few years ago, I had a fairly major project and it was around redesigning some of our, our major communication platforms with our clients in terms of how we were communicating from the savings product side of our business. And I was leading that project and we, we did a lot of work with, with a company that was helping us and we you know tested things with focus groups and everything else. We came up with what we thought was just the most brilliant actual communication piece. And then we launched it and it was a disaster. And we we had so many complaints from clients and we had so many people who were feeding back saying this doesn't make sense we don't understand it it was one of those those moments in my career where i just realized we went down a path based on what i believed the customer wanted and we we actually forgot to remember that at the end of the day the end user of what we were delivering their opinion matters more than mine and so you know it was one of those things where where you, you have to always be humble enough to acknowledge that just because i believe something is right or better doesn't actually make it the right solution for the people you're trying to deliver a product or a service for uh, you have to make sure you're staying connected with the end user of your product or your service or whatever you're delivering and make sure it's tailored to what they need, not based on what you believe they need. Yeah, that's, that's such a huge learning moment, right? And it, it comes back to your piece about being a lifelong learner and, and being uh, of the mindset that you're a lifelong learner because failure will happen. So it's being able to recognize there was a failure, learn from it, move on and, and 
have learned from it so that you don't repeat the same mistake again. I mean, we, we talk about this all the time in software, right? Where, so we're, we're building out a, a new product right now and we could just build out what we think is going to be the best thing. Cause yeah, we've, we've collected feedback. We have all these amazing ideas. We know what the user wants, right? That's what you think. Right? So instead of us just sitting in a dark room and building what we think you're going to want, we start out with what you call a minimal viable product. What's, what's the least amount it can do. It still has wheels. Instead of building a car, you build a skateboard. It still has wheels. It'll still get you from A to B. May not have all the bells and whistles that you're eventually going to want. But if I know you want a car, I don't know what kind of car you want until you start telling me what kind of car you want. So instead of us building you a Lamborghini, when it turns out you really wanted a Jeep to go off-roading, you're the one telling us. And if we come back to competencies, I mean, that's that's a lot of them, but you know, empathy, right? It's just being able to, to put yourself in that person's shoes to truly understand what they need from the solution that you're working towards. Yeah, absolutely. And being willing to listen uh, as well. You know, sometimes we have our own filters that, that, that we put in front of everything and, and we kind of listen to what people are saying through our filters of what we believe. I believe that what you need is the Lamborghini to use your example. And so whatever you say, I will, I'm going to somehow fit that into the picture of a Lamborghini, but you actually need to take those filters off and listen to what people are saying and really absorb it. I, I think that's a great, uh, a great analogy that you use there. Yeah, for sure. No, active listening is one of the skills that we, we've talked about a lot on this podcast and that along with curiosity, if you can pack both of those together, asking the right questions and then really listening to their answers is going to set you apart from a lot of people in life. Yeah, absolutely. So let's talk about actually curiosity and, and active listening. When it comes to hiring, Peter, I'm, I'm assuming that over the years you've been involved in a hiring decision or two. I have. Say. Yeah. Yes, I okay. have. So let me throw a hypothetical scenario at you. You're hiring for a new role and you've narrowed it down to two candidates. They have almost identical resumes on paper, but you can only hire one of them. What's, what's that competency? Like what's one of these 21st century skills that you've learned from over the years to, to look for that's going to separate one candidate from the other? So th there's a couple of things that I would, would throw out, and it comes back to some of what we've already talked about. One is one is that notion of active listening. I don't know, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll be doing an interview with a, a candidate and it feels like they're not really listening to the questions that I'm asking them. Right. They're giving me the answers that they think I want without mm -hmm. first truly listening to the question. I, I like to try to pose questions in a way that, that would require them to actually think about it right. uh, as opposed to, you know, there's, there's certain standard questions that everybody expects in an interview, but if you can kind of come out at it from a slightly different angle, you can really test to see, is this person someone who is truly listening to the question and then responding to that, that question in, mm -hmm. in the way that you, you phrased it? So I would say that's one thing. The other one that I always look for is an ability to problem solve creatively. Sometimes when you're you're faced with a problem and you know we I like to, when I, when I interviewed people, and I haven't done this for a, a while, but I, I did get involved with a lot of hiring in the past. I'd, I'd like to try to put a problem on the table and say, just tell me, you, know, you don't have to be in our industry. How would you attack this? problem and you look at sort of how they approach the problem and come at it from a sort of outside of the box type of a way to think around how do I attack this particular problem to see if I come up with some kind of a solution so you're yeah. looking for someone who's going to be an active listener but also someone who's going to be able to help look at a problem and come up with a creative way to try to address the problem yeah I, I love that you do this a recent guest we talked to does this exercise during the interview where they get somebody to, to draw this really abstract thing that they've never heard of and wouldn't have been able to prepare for. I come from a sales background. So you, you hear that classic analogy of, you know, sell me this pen as an exercise that they do in the middle of an interview. And at first I never really understood like why, I guess maybe they're just testing me to see what sales skills I know, but it's not that, I mean, it, it it's part active listening, but it's, it's really more the curiosity is what are, what questions are you going to ask? How do you, how do you solve a problem? So it, it's not like there's a right answer uh, necessarily to how do you sell me this pen, but what questions did you ask me as the interviewer about how I use a pen or how I write or what I need to do on a day that would involve a pen. So I love that you do that problem that's, solving, curiosity, active listening, all in one. Yeah. That's brilliant. Yeah, no, I love that. Yeah. Peter, what's a, a life skill that you weren't taught in high school, but maybe that you wish you were? <laughs> a life skill that I wasn't taught in high school, but I wish I was. Maybe maybe I should have spent more time learning French. That's one of the big, my big regrets that I didn't pick up as much French. I, I would say, you know, it, it, actually being being straight about this, this might not be considered a life skill, but, you know, multilingual skills is one of the things that I do regret not having more of, particularly here in Canada. I wish that I had had devoted more time to enhancing my ability to communicate in more than one language. It's it's one of those skills that I miss. We have a bilingual sales force, for example, and there's a chunk of my sales team that I can't communicate with directly. So that that might be one that I would, would kind of hone in on and say, I wish I had been more focused on really trying to understand the value of being able to communicate in more than one language when I was younger. 
great answer. I mean, you just, you hit it on the, the nail on the head there at the end with the communicate, right? I mean, that comes back to active listening and curiosity again, right? You can be a better listener and be more curious if you're able to speak the same language as the other person, right? Absolutely. So, it's a huge one for sure. Okay. Let's talk about, it's one of my favorite topics in this conversation is strong opinion, loosely held. So the way that I usually preface this is that a strong opinion loosely held is a strong opinion that you have, but you are still open-minded enough to receive new information as it becomes available. So for me, as an example, my strong opinion is that I believe that grades and tests, they do more harm than they do good. Do you have a strong opinion, Peter, that you can speak to? Yeah, I I have a a strong view that post-secondary education is a critical part of the journey to set individuals up for long-term success. You know, there is, there are, you know, whenever I say that, by the way, someone will always pull out an example of someone who didn't go past high school sure. and who is, a, you know, a billionaire. Mark Zuckerberg. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They didn't, yeah. they, they dropped out of high school and yet look at how successful they are. And, sure. and there are plenty of examples of, of that out there. We know that there are people who didn't go to post-secondary education who are very successful. And so it's not the only path, but I, I, I think you can prove it statistically that a post-secondary education is one of the best ways to make sure you are set up for long-term success. It helps you build out your skill sets in a more rounded way. If you're pursuing a professional route, obviously that's very critical to you, but, but it, it, it just sets you up in terms of being ready to go for the rest of, of your career. And so I strongly believe that post-secondary education is one of the most critical steps that people need to take. But I also would say that I, I see that post-secondary education is evolving. It continues to evolve. And so it's one of those things around how do you actually see this acquisition of skills that you, you get through a post-secondary education? There might be different ways of delivering it, but nonetheless, I still hold really firmly that post-secondary education is in fact a critical step to a long-term success. Yeah, no, it's a super important point. And, and then the stats are there. I mean, if you look at income as a stat anyways, that for those who are able to attend post-secondary versus those whose education stopped in grade 12, you are going to earn more money over your lifetime having that post-secondary education. But obviously it's not about money at the end of the day. And you know, we're talking about skills and, and competencies. And to your point at the very start of this, right, you can go to school for music and, and biology, but you're going to pick up all the other skills that will help make you more well-rounded and contributing citizen that you may not get the opportunity or may be more difficult to develop if you don't have the opportunity to attend post-secondary, right? So still a lot of value in it. And to your point, it is changing. Who knows what it will look like in 20, 30 years, but my gut tells me anyways, it's going to be hard to argue against lifelong learning or learning beyond grade 12, no matter what form that looks like as things continue to evolve, right? Yeah, totally agree with you. Cool. Peter, so let's do some, uh, some rapid fire questions for you. Yeah. You have a billboard. Everyone is going to see this billboard, but you can write one thing on it. What, What does that billboard say? Be yourself. A great answer. I mean, be authentic, be yourself. IQ or EQ, you can only pick one. Which one are you picking? A four, only one. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go EQ. Yeah, that's a good answer. Okay. Did you have a, a favorite class in, in high school growing up, Peter? I I loved music. Yeah. Was it always piano or did you ever venture outside of that? <sighs> I, I do a little guitar. I, I for a while I, I had a little dalliance with the saxophone, but it was always piano. I started piano when I was five. Uh, cool. I just I've stuck all the way through it, and it's just something that brings me a lot of a lot of joy. Yeah, uh, Peter, what, what's a book that you've read that's had such an impact on your life that maybe you wish you would have read it before you were eighteen? Wow, that's a really great question. How about, well, one of the ones that I, I, I really like is, it's by an author named John Maxwell. It's called The 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership. And it just lays out some of the things that if you want to be a leader, these are laws, you won't learn them necessarily in university or college. You can pill them, pick them up in a number of ways, but they, these are laws that you need to apply to your life to be an effective leader wherever you are. That's a great point. And, and you're going to be a leader at multiple different ages and, and stages of your life. It doesn't necessarily just mean a, a leader at a company and, and a manager role. You can be a leader in any type of role and you can be a leader outside of your nine to five uh, as well. So those are amazing skills to build off that formal education that you may receive. Uh, yeah. It, well, I'd say it's an important point to, to recognize that um, leadership is not just about the title you have. You can be a leader in every environment you're in. You can be a leader in your family. You can be a leader in your, your peer group. You can be a leader in your classroom. It's wherever you are, you can be a leader. And it's, I think it's, it's one of those, those things that, that people need to realize titles are less important uh, in determining leadership. There are people who have big titles that aren't great leaders. There are people who are amazing leaders who don't have the title. And so yeah. aspire to be a leader is what I would say, not not aspire for a title. Yeah, that's a great point. So let's finish it up, Peter, with, with one last hypothetical for you. You're superintendent of a school board and you're tasked with deciding one competency. So one of these 21st century skills that 
all of your students have to display evidence of uh, in their portfolio in order to graduate. What is that skill? I would come back to curiosity. To me, you know, when I look at my career, so I, I started with CST many years ago with Canadian Scholarship Trust many years ago in a very junior role. But what really I brought to the table was I was always wanting to understand more about the company, more about the business, more about what other people were doing. And that curiosity is what opened up all kinds of opportunities for me uh, to explore different areas where I could find different, different uh, things that I could bring to bear to help the organization continue to succeed. I think curiosity is one of those most important skills that if you can bring it to the table, it will open up doors and take you down paths that you might never imagine, but can bring you a great deal of, of joy and fulfillment. It's a good note to end this on. But let's just get a little bit more granular, Peter, because I, I love that answer. You know, I, we've talked about curiosity a number of times, even in today, you and I, but let's, let's say, so a few years ago, when you, we first started at a Canadian Scholarship Trust, what, what's an example of something you may have done to be curious, right? So like, was it just noticing that, hey, we're doing, we're, we're doing the process this way, but why are we doing it this way? There may be a better way to do it. Like, what, what's an example for someone listening to this about a way you could be curious on the job site? Yeah, so that's one example. I would say uh, the other way that I would think about it was, uh, so, you know, you can go to your job and you can put your head down and you can do your job. And you might even make improvements within your job and, and kind of keep narrowly focused to that. For me, it was more about, I would I would be talking to other people in the organization, people in completely unrelated roles to anything that I did, at right. least, you know, structurally and on paper. But you'd, you'd go and just say, well, what are you working on? What are you doing? What are your problems? What are your challenges that you're trying to solve? And even if they're in a completely different part of the organization, what you could often find is that either there was some connectivity between what they were doing and what I was doing, or it just helped you have a better perspective around how the various parts of the organization fit together. And so being open and curious about what else is going on and outside of just the sort of pure definition of your role can actually open up all kinds of not only opportunities for you, but also open up places where you can actually bring synergies between unrelated functions that can derive a great improvement in the organization. That's a perfect answer. Yeah. To, to be interesting, you have to be interested, right? Yeah. So Peter Lewis, I, I can't thank you enough, man. I appreciate you sharing your, your wisdom with all the young people listening to this. Happy Friday and, and have a great weekend. Great. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure.